Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Atlas Demo Day 2021. My name is Inza Valenciaga, and I will be moderating this event on behalf of Etzedo Space of Innovation and the Atlas European Funded Atlas Project. The reason why we invited you to this event is because we want to showcase the, what we've been doing so far, and that is the decentralized Atlas network. The reason, um, sorry, um, ultimately the aim is to persuade you to join us to this network and so that you can explore how this network works and also invest in this network. To this end, we have prepared an agenda full of use cases implementing technical solutions befitting to different agricultural challenges within Atlas. As you can see now in the program, you will see now a link in the chat. We will have five joint sessions by the Atlas Innovation Hubs and the Open Call winners. So no worry, you will get to know them as soon as they are introduced by our project coordinator, Stefan Rilling. We will plan to interact with you constantly via polls, questions and answers, and a panel discussion, as well as a final unique networking experience at 1, at 1 p.m. at the very end of the official end of the event. But before we go into the content and our speakers' presentations, I would like to quickly share with you a key housekeeping rule, and that is the chat function. You can find this option on the very right corner of the DLG platform. And you can use this um, channel to interact with us constantly via questions, concerns, comments, anything you may need, including uh, for troubleshooting. Uh, my colleagues behind the cameras will get back to you as soon as they can, but please bear with us. Um, we may have a lot of questions coming in, so we'll try to respond as soon as possible. If we don't manage today, we'll get back to you after the event, so do not worry. Now, without further ado, I will hand over to our very first speaker, the keynote speaker, Joel Bucket from the European Commission, DigiConnect. He will give us the opening to the Atlas Demo Day 2021. Over to you, Joel. Good morning. Welcome to this Atlas Demo Day. Uh, my name is Joel Bucket. I'm working in DigiConnect in the unit Internet of Things. To trigger this workshop, I would like to give you first an overview of the agricultural sector. Uh, the sector is currently facing a number of challenges. The first one is a new common agriculture policy. And the second one is the Green Deal. And as part of the Green Deal, the farm to fork strategy. You see on this slide, the farm to fork strategy and known as a number of very challenging targets. Uh, naming some, the reduction of chemical pesticide by 50%, the reduction of fertilizer by 20%. Of course, digital technology can really help achieving those challenges. Uh, naming some of them, the precision farming could really help uh, using, for example, IoT technology for that, sensors, but also automation. Robotics, robots could really also help also the life of the farmers. But there are a number of limiting factors. First, the lack of awareness of the benefits of the new technology, of the digital technology. And the second one, a key one, is the lack of interoperability between the different platforms, the digital platforms, supporting all the different applications. Going a little bit deeper, I would like to stress the essential role played by data and data sharing. Data could really transform the agriculture sectors like all the other sectors. The exploitation of data can make the lives of the farmers easier and also much better. It could also create innovation in creating new services, uh, new uh, advisory, for example, systems for the farmers. But what we really need is sharing the data. What the situation today? Uh, well, there are a number already of operational system, a number of initiatives, number of platform ecosystem sharing data. But they are working more in silo mode. There is a little interoperability portability between these different platforms initiatives. What we expect in a very soon future is to move towards a common European agricultural data space, uh, which will more or less federate the existing uh, system platform today. This will be implementing in the digital program as part of the first call. 
but I would also like to insist on the role of Atlas. Atlas could play a very key role in trying to solve the interoperability issues, in fact, and this is a core of the project. So it is definitely a, a key role to play by the project Atlas. With this short introduction, I thank you very much for listening, and I wish you a very a nice, productive workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joel. That was a very great opening to the Atlas Demo Day. I think the audience can already sense what this network is about. Um, however, to be on the very safe side, we would like to welcome you now to our project coordinator, Stefan Rilling, who will go in detail how this Atlas Decentralized Interoperability Network works and will try to demonstrate why you should also join and invest in our network. Over to you, Stefan. So thank you very much for the introduction. Also from my side, good morning and welcome to the Atlas Demo Day. My name is Stefan Rilling. I work as a researcher for Fraunhofer Institute for Intelligent Analysis and Information Systems. And I'm the coordinator of the ATLAS project. ATLAS is the acronym for Agricultural Interoperability and Analysis System. And within the next slides, I'm going to show you what ATLAS is, how ATLAS, work, Atlas works, and how you can benefit from ATLAS. So Atlas is a Horizon 2020 research project with quite a large consortium uh, consisting of stakeholders all along the agricultural value chain uh, over uh, from research uh, institutions uh, over industrial partners and SMEs up to uh, agricultural cooperatives and uh, commercial farmers, which are part of the consortium. So what are we doing in Atlas? So um, as you probably know, farming is uh, a quite complex process and it is already uh, quite digital. Um, so this is one example from one of our farming partners, one farm, multiple software systems in use. And probably this uh, um, will also increase in, in the future, even for smaller operations. And as you can see here, there is uh, there are already dozens of software tools available on um, the market, usually serving for a very particular need. And uh, the problem starts when uh, these software systems have to work together. And um, this is uh, exactly what Atlas wants to improve. Um, uh, meaning we Atlas targets uh, for an improved interoperability of agricultural software systems. So for us, interoperability mainly um, is the exchange of data between uh, all entities. So if software systems can exchange data, they are interoperable. And uh, Atlas enables this uh, both on a syntactic and a semantic level, meaning we work on things like uh, messaging standards and we work on uh, digital models of agricultural processes. And to implement this, we developed uh, the concepts of the Atlas interoperability network. So uh, the, one of the basic concepts is data is exchanged through standardized services and also very important, the, this network of services is decentralized, meaning there are no data silos, there are no central data hubs, and uh, thus Atlas is not a, a platform. However, Atlas needs a minimum of uh, centralized components to work. I will explain this uh, on the next slides. And Atlas forms a network of trusted autonomous participants providing software systems. So the main users of the Atlas interoperability network are software system providers. We designed this interoperability uh, network architecture uh, along a set of driving factors. So we wanted to have the network uh, open 
and with very low possible entry barriers. We wanted to uh, achieve interoperability uh, through standards. We want to develop new standards, but we also want to support already defined and established standards. Also, this network needs the ability to evolve the interoperability, um, meaning that we have to react fast to emerging needs and innovation. This means concretely, we have to be fast when developing new standards. And also Atlas is uh, aiming for providing edge computing uh, technology and bringing this edge computing technology to the network of services. So putting all this together, um, we have a ecosystem of different stakeholders. Um, we have software providers and their end users, which are usually farmers, but are not limited to this. And we have the Atlas central components. So um, software providers can either be service providers offering an Atlas service or service consumers, which consume an Atlas service. Um, both of these uh, entities are connected through the central components service registry and the Atlas participant portal. So the Atlas participant portal, it, this is the main entry point for Atlas participants. The Atlas participant portal uh, offers a graphical user interface enabling participants to manage their services, manage their participant uh, data and get their uh, services validated. Um, the process, process of setting up such a service in Atlas is shown uh, in the next demo video. So each participant has an account on the participant portal and thus can use this account to log in. Then we have this kind of a dashboard like overview of uh, all the participant services. And now the participant uh, enters the data to add a new service to the Atlas interoperability network. Here some parameters describing the service have to be entered. So service name and a service description. But the main parameters are uh, the service base URL, where the endpoints of a service can then be reached and uh, all the O of two um, uh, parameters needed to establish uh, the pairing of different services. So this is uh, now entered into this uh, user interface. And once uh, that has been done, um, the participant can then choose a specific service template which was used to implement the service. So in the end, service templates are the, the standards all Atlas conformance services have uh, followed to. So in this case, we decide um, we have implemented the services uh, dealing with field data. So uh, this is uh, now selected. And once that is uh, chosen, um, the service is created and can then be, after being uh, uh, reviewed at last time, can then be published. Once the service is published, um, its state changes to, uh, in, uh, you can see that here in a moment, its state changes to pending to be approved. So once that service is uh, announced to Atlas and published, the automatic validation will take place. And also once that is passed uh, through a manual interaction, this service will be then approved by an Atlas administrator. So the example on this slide shows uh, now how uh, service clients and services are interconnected. Um, in this example, we have an FMIS software with a, a fertilization advisor service client 
And we have a fertilization platform offering a fertilization advisor service. Uh, important here is that uh, both uh, that the end user using these two systems has an account on both of the system on the FMIS and the fertilization platform. Um, data is then shared on behalf of this user and the means to interconnect service client and uh, um, the fertilization advisor service are queried uh, from the service registry. So the Atlas approach to uh, interoperability offers uh, several opportunities for both software providers and uh, farmers as their end users. Um, for example, Atlas enables the interconnection of existing systems so you can just retrofit your, your uh, existing and uh, uh, proven uh, software system uh, easily with Atlas capabilities and thus um, making it uh, uh, not necessary to develop everything from scratch when you want to join the Atlas interoperability network. Atlas also adds flexibility for the farmers. Uh, it enables farmers to avoid the vendor lock-in and uh, allows for flexible choices and decisions when it comes to the software systems they want to use. Atlas is also an uh, innovation catalyst that guarantees flexibility and openness. And uh, it does that by enabling small and innovative companies to focus on their USP. So think about the uh, previous example with the uh, fertilization platform. So for, for the providers of such a software system, there is no need to build a full flexed uh, farm management uh, information software with, with a graphical user interface or with an advanced graphical user interface around that software because it can easily be connected with such a system. And Atlas also enables the, uh, uh, to, uh, to build up a more, more complex uh, operation and, and data flows by efficiently combining uh, different existing participant services. Uh, although we have uh, developed uh, already a significant part of the Atlas interoperability architecture, we are still uh, based and, and working on with uh, several um, challenges. So, for example, when it comes to, to standard APIs, to standard definitions, um, we always have to ask ourselves about uh, the level of granularity versus the level of generalization. So how many different processes uh, can be uh, summed up upon uh, one common service template and thus uh, upon um, uh, one common standard. Also having central infrastructures like the service registry requirements, uh, requires governance and operations. So we need to make sure uh, a fair access uh, with low entry barriers uh, to meet the participants' interests. And also very important, uh, the topic uh, around safety, security, and privacy. We need to make sure uh, safety and security of the Atlas network and uh, while staying GDPR compliant. So, and um, to uh, meet these challenges and to work on this, we are, are really uh, depending also on the, the views and opinions of external stakeholders. And to get this input, we established uh, the concept of innovation hubs. So uh, innovation hubs uh, are in the end uh, places to meet and inform for you, places where we have installed uh, new technology in a, a real world environment and thus the innovation hubs are all located at uh, the pilot uh, studies location of the Atlas project. Uh, these innovation hubs will be presented in great detail within the next two hours. So this leads me already to the conclusion of this talk. So Atlas offers a new level of interoperability by establishing a decentralized uh, service oriented architecture. Um, uh, with, this, with this architecture and with this system implemented, the interconnection of agricultural machines, sensors and data services becomes possible and thus um, 
this system helps to digitalize um, farming operations. So Atlas simplifies all the processes from farm to fork and offers new business model for and with the farmer. So thank you very much for the uh, uh, attention and uh, now back to the moderation team. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Stefan. That was very instructive and very clear, and I'm sure the audience has a very clear image of how the Atlas network works. If you have any questions for Stefan, please do not be shy. Use the chat and ask any questions you have. Um, do not worry, we will try to answer you via the chat, but if it's not now, we can also use the networking experience at 1 p.m. to interact with the speakers. So don't worry, you will be, your questions will be answered. Now that you know more about Atlas, we would like to get to know you better. And this is why we have prepared uh, some poll questions uh, that we would like you to answer via the chat. So you will see now the question coming in the chat. I think it's already there and people are answering. Great. The first question is to know you. Where are you coming from? Who do you represent? And I see already very quickly the, quest the answers coming. <laughs> We see that many are coming from the service providers, software developer uh, industry, 45%. We have also academia, 38%, 36 now. Other also, um, you can also feel free to use the chat and specify where is this other coming from. We also have public authority, 4%. Even if it's a few, it's important that we have them. So that's wonderful. And surprisingly, no one answered for a farmer, huh? All right, that's very, that's quite surprising actually. We did expect some farmers, uh, but it's, it's pretty clear that most of you come from the software development industry. Um, so yeah, I think this is also good to know for us, but also for you in the audience to know who is behind the cameras and who you can network with uh, via DLG Connect platform. Great, I see there are no more changes coming in. Um, so maybe we can, move on to the next question. The next question is what opportunities and challenges do you see in joining the Atlas network? So if you have an opportunity coming through your mind, maybe specify with an O that that is an opportunity and if it's a challenge, also maybe start the sentence with C. Uh, then we know which, which one you mean because sometimes uh, the differences are a bit blurry. Um, and uh, for some might be a challenge and for others might uh, be an opportunity. So we see the first word, Kazakhstan. Um, I'm not sure what this mm, is meant to be, but probably the place from um, you are joining the Atlas network. Um, I don't know the challenges or what opportunities, but please try to indicate clearly um, what are the, the challenges and opportunities you see. We see partnerships, exactly. So this is a network, so this is a great opportunity to partner and to find other um, yeah, networking opportunities. Connect data, that is true. We can uh, find this uh, as a way to connect different data from the agricultural sector. The network itself, I assume this is an opportunity, but it could also be a challenge, right? Um, depending uh, on the situation. Well, it's clearly that the big opportunity is a partnership. That's what we have here. Smart farming, true. I don't know if this is an opportunity or a challenge, but um, yeah, surely more as an opportunity. A challenge also ecosystem adoption. That is true. That is also a very good point. We also have data decentralization. Centralization. Well, this is a decentralized one, so we will see how well, sorry, my colleagues are moving this because I'm not able to see completely the screen. Um, but now I'm seeing it a bit clearer now. All right. We also have a challenge, improve data exchange, true. This could be also uh, a way, well, if we are trying to, yeah, we can improve this data, we can um, see with the network. Um, what else do we have coming on? Join a big community, that would be an opportunity. Again, this is a bit linked to the partnership and trust, a challenge, true. It could be also linked to the security, um, yeah, and the GDPR reasons that Stefan mentioned. Um, all right, I think we are, we can see a scheme already, but it's clear that partnership is the big uh, highlighting uh, opportunity uh, via this network. 
So wonderful, let's close the polls and let's move on um, to the next section where we will try to have a joint session composed by the Innovation Hubs and the Open Call winners. Um, the very first speaker will be Andreas Panagopoulos, who will represent the Innovation Hub in Greece. And then we have Marco Bezzi, who is one of our first Open Call, open call winners from Italy. Over to you both. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for uh, the introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad to introduce you to the Atlas Innovation Hub established in Greece. Our hub hosts the five extensively instrumented and over 2,100 non-instrumented pilot and demo fields at which the Atlas Irrigation Service are developed with uh, the concerted action of the involved partners. Our services utilizes all existing technological breakthrough solutions to answer everyday questions. How much groundwater is available in my area? Is there enough moisture in my soil? When and how much water should I apply to my crop? How am I crop evolving and how many temperature extreme episodes did it face? In Atlas, we fully understand that not everyone has or wants or can afford the infrastructure to instrument every field. We also acknowledge the multitude of technological solutions offered, these being ground-based instrumented monitoring or satellite data-driven. We develop, the end user chooses. Whatever the end user decides to use, however, needs to be well justified and documented. And that's why our team has done its homework in developing scientifically sound and exhaustively tested tools to deliver seamless and reliable solutions. Tools that are making use of data in standardized format to accommodate any provider or consumer that wants to join the Atlas platform. Service development and testing is based on extensive field surveys. It also includes high frequency online monitoring with climate stations, cosmic ray, neutron probes, RGB cameras, water meters, subflow instruments, and soil moisture sensor clusters, all dedicated to Atlas project. Through the services, farmers can look back in time and study the evolution of critical meteorological parameters, such as the precipitation and the temperature. Likewise, they can look ahead to the forecast of precipitation and temperature. They can study the soil moisture profile at their fields and assess their irrigation practices performance through the analysis of soil moisture content. Of course, they can have an instruction of the optimal irrigation dose to be applied when they want or can irrigate. These are easy to use tools in their native language that make their everyday life easier and their decisions scientifically based rather than empirical. In addition, satellite temperature analysis services have been developed in the Innovation Hub. Thermal infrared images as well as weather models are used to provide spatially distributed temporally dense growing degree days and frost hours with spatial temporal resolution of one kilometer an hour. More than 2,100 fields are integrated in the system and served. The service is particularly useful for non-instrumented fields and has no installation and maintenance costs. Seeing is believing, and our hub is a welcoming environment which does exactly this. It offers a golden opportunity to visit our pilot fields, see the instrumentation, test the services, and discuss with our farmers, the end users. It is a forum of networking for exchanging ideas, learn from other examples, and collaborate with similar service providers, such as Blue Tentacles, one of the Atlas Open Call winners that have joined our family. Our hub is a living lab of high added value, as Stamatis and Theodora tell us. As a farmer, a farmer, I always want to improve the cultivation practices I use to reduce production costs and, of course, the use of natural resources. In our farms, we try to adopt environmental-friendly practices. Irrigation optimization will help us consume less energy for pumping water, save water, and therefore the risk of waterborne infections to our orchards. 
As the local economy is mainly based on agriculture, sustainable farming is a very important part of this plan. Through the implementation of national and EU-funded projects like ATLAS, the farmers and the local community gain access to innovative skills and ideas, to new technologies and tools, and to the scientific research. Well, that's all from me. It's time to introduce you now to Blue Tentacles, one of uh, our open call, wheel, uh, open call winners. So, Marco, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andreas, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Today, in my presentation, I would like to introduce uh, Blue Tentacle Solution and our journey in the Atlas project. We are based in North Italy, where there is one of the major apple production areas in Europe, Valdinon. Valdinon takes uh, 14,000 of cubic meter of water a year to irrigate the 7,000 hectares of apples. The amount of water is the equivalent of 6,000 Olympic swimming pool. Water is essential for farmers to obtain a good quality of the apples. We're in the Dolomites, where we are used to have a lot of water, but the water shortage is starting also here. Imagine in other areas with less water resources. And Valdinon is a very small part of the world area. And agriculture is using 70% of water resources worldwide. FAO estimates an increasing of the water deficit gap by 2050 worldwide. Blue Tentacles is working mainly with drip irrigation system. Drip irrigation is a perfect solution to save water. There are already 9 million hectares installed worldwide <coughs> with drip irrigation, and this value is increasing by 50% a year. But generally, drip irrigation systems are managed with time-based scheduling program without considering weather data or soil humidity data. There is a huge waste of water, and the water use is even too much to reach high-quality products. At Blue Tentacles, we have been working for three years to support farms and farmers to be more efficient in production with drip irrigation, improving product quality and reducing farm cost by using the proper amount of water for each crop. Blue Tentacles is a complete solution based on IoT and AI, able to transform all the irrigation schemes into smart irrigation system. Blue Tentacles is able to acquire data from weather station, soil moisture sensor, and meteor forecast model to provide to farmers the best daily irrigation advice. Blue Tentacles is also able to control all the irrigation system in a more efficient way by a revamping process. There are many other solutions on the market, but most of them are providing just monitoring or irrigation advice. By Blue Tentacles, with a single solution, enable farmers to have a full control over their irrigation system. Over the last three years, we have been working not only with apples, but also with peer, tobacco, small berry, and wineries. Our customers have realized the importance of saving water and the importance of using the proper amount of water to reach high quality products. Benefit for users are a decreasing in water and energy consumption, an increasing of product quality, and a reduction of operational cost and risk of bad products. We are very proud of our journey in the Atlas project. And thanks to Atlas, we were able to implement our new IoT management platform, allowing us to be more interoperable with other solutions. We started active collaboration with other members of the project, and an important collaboration was with the Atlas irrigation and architecture team. They supported us with their research expertise, providing to the user an advanced and interoperable solution. We will keep in touch with them, participating in future activities for a continuous improving of what we have done so far. That's all what I wanted to share with you today. Thanks for your attention. And now back to the studio, and I'm happy to answer to all your questions. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you both, Andreas and Marco, for showcasing your use cases with your presentations. Now, we are very happy to have you both for the first question and answer session. So please, again, the audience, use the chat, and uh, we will ask all your questions to our presenters. In the meantime, um, as we um, start receiving your questions, I will read an important question that we have received through the registration process. And I think also that this is a valuable question for everyone uh, in, in the audience. 
And this question is actually for you, Andreas. I see you there. I don't see Marco yet, but hopefully he can hear us and he will join us soon. So, Andreas, this question is to you. Is the installation of so many inexpensive instruments necessary to get an irrigation service? What do you say? Excellent question, uh, Insa. Thank you very much for asking this. Well, the answer is a big no. No, you don't need to install all this expensive and fancy equipment, but in order to deliver good services that are soundproof and deliver uh, quite uh, good results, we do need to do our homework, as I explained, in uh, making sure that everything works uh, well and it's reliable. That's why we've installed all these uh, expensive and the precise instruments to make sure that we can offer something we can uh, that can be operable, operating uh, and uh, giving uh, accurate results without spending fortunes. So the answer, so is, the answer is no, you don't, no, need, all you don't need all this. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Andreas. And now, Marco, I see you are there, so that's great. And I already see a question for you. It says, what do you think is the best way to introduce your new technology to farmers who may be reticent or rather not acknowledging the technology that you are offering? What would you say to this question? Yeah, thank you for the question. I, say, I would say that the best way is to uh, start with the champions uh, to try the solution. Uh, during the last two irrigation season, we have sold our solution to large wineries. They are happy with the botanical solution and now are they convincing the most uh, uh, reluctant farmers to adopt it. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Marco. All right. Um, All right. Let's um, see more questions. Let's see more questions. I see many of them coming through, but I need to scan. Um, so let me see which one we could ask. Andreas, perhaps this one. Why should I select your service and not an already available solution offered by a company? What do you say? Well, we're talking about uh, interoperability and uh, free choice uh, from uh, the side of the end user. This means that uh, you are free to join uh, whichever part of the service, not a complete suite necessarily, because you might already have access to data or to some parts of the services that we are developing. Uh, this is the big incentive. Uh, it's, uh, it's up to you to decide which exactly part you want to um, select from us and to puzzle it, uh, make it work together with any other part of services that you have. Wonderful. Thank you, well, Andreas. And this one goes to you, Marco. What is the main competitive advantage of blue tentacles? Tentacles. I think that the main competitive advantage of Blue Tentacles is to offer a complete solution that includes monitoring, irrigation advice, and the remote management of the, the system. Another advantage is the ability to revamp all the irrigation systems, so farmers don't need to change the system, but they just have to integrate our solution. All right. Thank you, Marco. Right. And I think we still have time for another one. Um, and this one goes to you also, Andreas. Um, it says, do I need to offer a full scale solution or a suite of solutions to join Atlas Network as a provider? This is good for the providers. Excellent. Excellent. It's a, actually, this is one of the big catches of our platform. No, you don't need to offer a complete solution. You need to offer whatever you have to offer. You may be a big uh, provider or a small provider or a startup, whatever you are, if you have something reliable that can uh, plug into our platform, then you're welcome to do it. And certainly you're going to join all the benefits. It's was short, concise, but straight to the point. Thank you, Andreas. And uh, Marco, this one also goes to you. Is there any limitation in the application of your technology? No, there is any limitation. We can uh, work both with uh, small farms, uh, but even with big corporates. Uh, so there is no, we have a specific target that is uh, 10 hectares farms uh, for our business model, but uh, we can provide solution even to uh, farms uh, uh, smaller than one hectare. Yeah. 
Great. Thank you, Marco. Great. Thank you, Marco. And, last, and last very question. last question. We still have time. So this one is to you again, Andreas. Um, how can I visit your pilot fields and participate to your hubs activities? Well, to start with, we would be delighted to have uh, everyone uh, along in our uh, pilots and our uh, hub. Uh, our hub is based in Greece, uh, two uh, places uh, for the pilots, uh, central and northern Greece. You can find details in our scheduled uh, program that obviously due to COVID changes <coughs> um, consecutively. But uh, the answer is uh, uh, tap uh, the uh, Atlas uh, project uh, platform, um, sorry, site. And you can find all the details either in uh, under the contact uh, tab or even more under the innovation hub tab and we'll be happy to meet you and uh, show you around. Wonderful, thank you both. Um, I see there are more questions coming through, but for now we will move on. But don't worry, we'll get back to you either after the event, via the chat, or even in the networking uh, session that we will have at 1 p.m. and you all will be able to talk to all the speakers in different groups. Now, we will move on to the next speakers. They will be representing again the Atlas Innovation Hub and an open call winner, but in this case, both from Germany. Um, in this case, I need to inform you that we had a last minute change and our presenter from the Innovation Hub, uh, DLG Crop Production Center, Florian Schneider, unfortunately won't be able to be here for the question and answer session. Uh, but don't worry, we have a replacement for him and it will be his colleague Robert Hilden instead. Um, for this reason, Florian had to provide us with a pre-recorded um, video for his presentation. So for now, I will simply say over to Florian's uh, presentation. Thank you. Welcome to the International DAG Crop Production Center of German Agricultural Society here in Bernburg. We are the DAG's experimental farm with approximately 600 hectares on which we investigate special issues relating to arable farming. We are the German innovation hub for the Atlas project. Embedded in the agricultural herd of Germany, we offer the meeting point for all interested stakeholders around the topic of digitalization in the Atlas project. We are developing the use cases on the demonstration farms here in Germany and bring uh, results to the agricultural stakeholders in order to arouse more interest in the Atlas project. The location is a historically shaped agricultural site where several agricultural institutions are also located. We at the International DAG Crop Production Center maintain close cooperation with the local agricultural institutions. These institutions are the University of Applied Science, the Saxony-Anhalt State Institution, for agriculture and horticulture, the German Farmers Association and the KWS seeds, which we can inform about the project and the resulting results. Now you can get to know the voice. I'm a Florian Schiller. I'm a project manager for digital agriculture here at the DLG International Crop Production Center and I'm responsible for the German Innovation Hub in the Atlas project. Come with me and I will give you more information about the International DLG Crop Production Center and Atlas Innovation Hub. Here we are on our agricultural trial plots where we are investigating questions relating, relating to crop production.
DLG maintains about 50 expert committees, some of which deal with current topics in the crop production and work out solutions with us at the International DLG Crop Production Center. Choose we work on topics uh, ranging from soil cultivation, crop rotation, biodiversity and species diversity to subsoil irrigation. For the Atlas project, we also serve as a demonstrator with our facilities here at the site in order to demonstrate use cases for the Atlas project. Now you could get a short overview of the International DLG Crop Production Center as Atlas Innovation Hub Germany. Please come and visit us so that we, uh, that we can give you more information about the Atlas project. Now let's go to Andreas from Equolution as one of the German Open Call winners who demonstrate his solutions for the project at the farm Stefan Kühne. Yeah, thank you, Florian, for the nice introduction. And hello, everybody. My name is Andreas. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Equolution. And I'm very honored to talk to you and show you a little bit about our work and what we have achieved during the Open Call project. So climate smart irrigation management, you see already, it has something to do with the climate. It has something to do with irrigation and management. And it's maybe also uh, something smart we will see in the end. Um, but before we do this, I will quickly introduce your Equolution and I will show you which innovations we are driving forward. So I'm a farmer myself and um, I was standing in the field every time and I always was wondering how we can adapt on the weather and how we can mitigate its effects. Because this is the most crucial part in the daily life of a farmer. If it's raining, you cannot go to the field. If it's not raining, it won't grow anything on the field maybe. So how can we do this? How can we adapt on the climate um, risk on our field? So we could use, of course, the old farmer's almanac, um, climate weather in June, that's corn and tune. It would be one option. But is it climate smart? We think, no, it's not climate smart. We need something better. We need a data-driven approach because we are facing huge problems. We need not only to adapt on the climate, we also need to mitigate uh, the, its effects and uh, lower our carbon footprint. And on the other hand, um, we also need to stay profitable because if we don't earn any money, it doesn't make sense. We cannot uh, proceed with our business in agriculture. So that is where Equolution comes in. We uh, try to help. We um, try to help on adapting on climate risk and mitigate the effects. And this is um, where we technology needs. So we need a data driven approach here to tackle this issue. And a lot of problems um, are in the data structure. So we have, for some reason, we have a lot of different standards, a lot of different uh, types of data, and we have um, more sensors uh, coming on the market. So we have a mess there. And that is what we solve. We integrate different IoT standards. So we integrate different data formats, geospatial data, we fuse it and give the farmer a full stack, a full layer stack 
of a field so that we don't have a mess we have a perfect view of what is going on on the field and what we see on the field the next thing we can do after we have analyzed with this uh, technology stack where to where we have differences in the field we can add sensors to monitor actually the plant growth to monitor the microclimate or to monitor the soil moisture send, uh, soil moisture and therefore we designed a fully new uh, system which is called Clamavi and which we use for monitoring uh, soil moisture data in different layers also we use it for monitoring uh, uh, precipitation and other microclimate data and use this data in combination with the geospatial data sets to fuel new uh, models which helps to predict climate risk and if we know at which time point and which field climate risk occur then we could adapt and we does, doesn't need to use the old farmers almanac any, anymore and this is actually what we're doing on the um, field site at Stefan Kühne, where we applied the sensor network after we uh, analyzed uh, his fields. We installed sensors on reference points and actually to measure during the season, the soil moisture can contain in different layers, but also measure the uh, temperature on the plant canopy. And after we have done this, we also uh, installed um, a system in the Atlas project so we um, adapted to the atlas standard but uh, also developed with our other colleagues from the open call and from the colleagues from the atlas project a standard for iot and microclimate data with this service template developed um, out of the um, collaboration we can have an interoperability standard so that every sensor provider could adapt on the standard and could send the data to the atlas platform with a template and this is what we achieved here. So we um, have developed a system where we can avoid uh, different um, heterogeneous data standards. We have just one solution for all. And this is quite a good thing to farmers because uh, they don't need to struggle anymore with um, different data formats. They just can concentrate on their work and can concentrate on adapting to the climate. And with this final words, I will hand over to my, the ladies. So I'm happy to answer your questions in the next uh, few min minutes. And I'm looking forward to that. Wonderful. Thank you very much, both Florian, for providing this uh, pre-recorded presentation, and also to you, Andreas, for your smart and insightful presentation. Um, now we will move on to the questions and answers sessions. Um, if I see both speakers, okay, I see Andreas there. Great. Hi, Andreas. Um, but I cannot see Robert yet, the colleague of uh, Florian, but let's see if he manages to join. And if not, well, Andreas will go with you. But, but can you hear me? Can you hear me? That's Hi. Hi, Robert. Hi. Is this you? So that works. If oh great okay. we can hear you okay maybe you cannot okay, see, not see. <laughs> exactly we cannot see robert but we will be able to hear him that's wonderful great then i'll start with you andreas because i see the first question uh, to you and it says what does the iot sensor measure exactly yeah it's one of the most asked questions so iot has um as a core it says that we have energy self-sufficient uh, radio technologies which you can use to connect sensors so our device is basically a platform where you connect different sensors a precipitation sensor you can add a temperature sensor you can add a soil moisture sensor and um, one of our improvements or our solutions we applied for a patent for that is uh, that we have developed a new type of soil moisture sensor we connect with our uh, radio module so we have a full integrated uh, microclimate sensor which measures soil moisture content in four depths, up to four depths, and also temperature in the soil in four depths, um, then temperature in the yeah, plant canopy. And you even can add precipitation sensor on it, or a wind speed or wind direction sensor, or a leaf wetness sensor, and it's all integrated in one device. And then the data is transferred, energy self-sufficient to the cloud, where you can send it to or push it to uh, Atlas partners, or address compatible partners or use it uh, on your own. 
Right, wonderful. Thank you, Andreas. Oh, and now we can even see you, Robert. That's that's great. Great. <laughs> great. Then I, I have a question twice, for you. Fine. Sorry. <laughs> Good. Okay. <laughs> Go Good. We have the question for you, and it says, "How can DLG International Crop Production Center inform stakeholders about the Atlas project and the results of the use cases around digitalization?" Oh, good question. Um, you know, purpose demo days, for example, like right now, um, are car carried out along uh, the whole time of the project. But like you know, we make also exhibitions and on these exhibitions we have the chance to inform the relevant stakeholders as well and, um, and show the strengths um, of it and of the whole project. Um, in addition, next year we will have hopefully the Agritechnica in Hannover uh, and uh, we will inform about the entire project um, and address it to the relevant stakeholders here as well. Um, in addition, we have field days um, in summertime where we also um, uh, can talk about the relevant crop production topics of the Atlas project. Um, and uh, last but not least, the DLG Eurotier will be used to address um, the application cases um, from the livestock uh, sector. Um, and for the more workshop will be organized along the use cases um, to discuss uh, the specific topics and by the way yesterday we have an expert talk online on our dlg connect um, platform and here we also have two very good speakers from the atlas project where everyone who is interested can informed about the project itself great wonderful thank you robert um, I see another question for you, Andreas. Um, what is the problem with IoT sensors and interoperability? This is very relevant for, for our audience. Over to you. Yes. So we have, for example, on the one hand, the hardware issue. So that is basically what every um, sensor provider needs to do on its own, I guess. So for example, we have several standards like SDI-12 and weather stations or weather sensors. It's quite common. Uh, Modbus and things like that. You need to integrate it uh, on one device that you have really a plug and play system because the end user, the farmer, doesn't know about or doesn't care about um, the sensor uh, protocol which is using. You just want to have the data to manage uh, the farm more efficiently. So that is what we do on the one hand, integrating SDI 12, Modbus, and um, I2C, for example, as protocols for the hardware. That you have a plug and play system. And on the other, on the other hand, you have a problem um, because in the software part, every sensor is sending data, but um, the um, formats are quite different. And even the formats um, for, um, for better data sets are quite different. So you need to fuse them. One example if you have a temperature um, value for one geo point, that's good to have. But in many cases, you have several sensor points in, in a vertical alignment. So we have um, four or six different temperature uh, values. And maybe these temperature values are measured with different sensor types. So maybe there's used a Sensorian sensor or a Bosch sensor or maybe a known development. And you need to make clear or make you need to uh, find a way to harmonize this and to uh, secure an interoperability also in the software part that you know which sensor has sent or has produced this data point. And this is very crucial and very important. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Very good. Thank you, Andreas. And I see we have another one for you, Robert. Um, what information activities are you planning for the next year around the use cases so that the stakeholders are sufficiently informed? Yes, uh, good question. Some of the topics I already answered in the question before, but uh, what also quite important is uh, that we have a bright network in the DLG, which we also use. It um, means we have 1,000 members, we have um, more than 50 expert committees, and um, informed um, the whole sector. So that means we use the primary, but also to the upstream and downstream sectors of 
of Arvik. Um, and especially the expert committee also informed about the project all the meetings long. Um, so I think with that bright uh, possibilities, we can inform mm -hmm. everyone, uh, not just stakeholders, but also interesting farmers and people who are just interesting in what's going on in the project. Yes, thank you, Robert. And it's true, it's quite similar to the previous one, but I have to scan all the questions, so it's a bit difficult sometimes to choose the right one. Yeah, but I hope yeah, the no next problem. one is the right one. And this one is for you, Andreas, <laughs> and we will conclude here with you. Um, how many soil moisture sensors do we need on an average arable farm? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, it's a second um, asked or the most um, relevant question for many farmers, but it depends. It depends on the use case. Um, if you have an arable farm with wheat uh, mainly, then you would maybe only use one sensor for uh, to represent 50 hectares, for example. But it really depends on your soil and the heterogeneity on your topographic um, situation. And that's what I tried to explain. Uh, before we install a sensor, um, we make an analysis where to put the sensor, where is a good reference point. So in terms of soil moisture, you need to know where the, whether uh, the soil water comes, where it flows into the, um, from, from which hill, in which direction. And then you can classify um, the regions and can say, okay, in this region, there's a lot of groundwater. It's maybe a clay soil. Um, in another region, there's a sandy soil. There's not so much water. These are two very, um, so minimum, maximum fields, classes. So you put one sensor in the clay and one in the sandy soil, and maybe you have something, some soil type in between, and then you would choose um, this um, average soil, so, so to say, at the third reference point. And this is what our algorithm does. So it helps to find the best point in the field, the best geolocation, and put the sensor in. So if you ask me about one, average number of one, one number, then I would say one sensor per 50 hectares. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Wow, that was in incredible to know. And um, I think it's very insightful for everyone um, and rewarding. All right. Thank you both. We will now need to move on as the time is of the essence. And we will move all the way to Romania, where our next speaker, Aurora Ranca, will be introducing the innovation hub from Murfatlar. Apologize for my pronunciation. Over to you, Aurora. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the introduction in this presentation. Hi, I'm Aurora Ranca, and uh, I will present you the Innovation Hub from Murfatla, Romania. We are here in the research unit located in the main viticultural area of the southeast of uh, the country. Here are located over 50 profile companies that manage over 8,000 hectares or vineyards. to promote new ideas and approaches in the field in order to respond to the farmer's need to increase the value of their products and their work environment. One of our major concerns is to reduce the use of pesticides by building a modern and fast decision-making system based on massive data collection. To achieve this goal, through the ATLAS project, we installed four weather stations whose sensors allow to monitoring of climate, soil moisture at different depths, the state of plant development, and the rate of infection.
by massively collecting and transmitting data in real time through network to which all interested participants have access. The foundation are created for the implementation of precision technology in vine farm throughout smart management of plant health. What are the means to achieve this objective? As Innovation Hub, we organize demonstrative days, participate at profile exhibition, and publish and knowledge transfer through workshops. By applying this concept, we contribute to the creation of a sustainable business ecosystem, beneficial for both farmers and consumers. Besides collecting and share vineyard data, we are promoting new intelligent means for farm management as a vineyard application. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you Aurora for this inspirational presentation on your vineyards. The next pre presentation takes us to Slovenia where our speaker Matić Šerk is going to introduce his use case as one of the first open con call winners last year. Matić, the floor is yours. Hello, my name is Matić Šerk. I'm coming from Elmibit and I will speak about a vineyard in Atlas. So very quickly about the vineyard. Um, a vineyard is a set of digital vineyard management software tools that is used by hundreds of wine growers on five continents at the moment to improve their results. And the tools are related to different aspects of their activities. So they help them with observations, recording and decision making then planning what needs to be done, where and how, um, tracking of what was done, along with the details and of course reporting. And now our most progressive customers um, today are implementing precision viticulture practices. Right? And now what is precision viticulture? Precision viticulture means observing, measuring and then responding with viticultural practices based on the variability of the crops. Um, this approach obviously has positive environmental and economic impacts, but of course it adds quite some difficulty to the workflows of the grower. And while there are small growers with a yeah, small number of plants that can practice this manually, it is practically impossible to practice precision viticulture in bigger operations with tens and hundreds of thousands of vines and millions of vines. And for that we have tools for precision viticulture uh, in existence today, which include physical tools such as, for example, machinery with GNSS systems, uh, variable rate application systems, and so on. Um, and we have the software tools such as applications, farm management software, and all of those tools eventually need to somehow work together uh, in order to deliver value to the bigger 
um, let's say, organization. Now, we're a solar company and we're supporting wine growers and they started asking us, okay, can you provide precise maps with individual vines and other vineyard assets because of the need to practice precision viticulture? And we said, yeah, why? And they said, well, we want to track properties, activities, yield, everything on a vine level because most of the systems today on the market, they allow us to track all of those things on the block level, but if we really want to use full potential of precision viticulture in large scale, then vine level is required in digital form for many aspects, such as, for example, planning of precision vineyard management uh, with precise work orders where some things need to be done, creation of variable rate maps and so on. And this can serve as an infrastructure also for different machinery operations. So there is a number of uses for having digital vineyard infrastructure in precision viticulture. And now, thanks to Atlas, eVineyard today offers a digital tool for generating vineyard maps at RTK level precision with less than two point centimeters error. So very high accuracy maps. And those maps are produced in a very simple set of steps. First, a survey of key points in the vineyard needs to be done according to a prescribed procedure. Um, ideally, this is done with a high precision surveying device, RTK surveying device, but it can also be done with a drone or a mobile app. And based on that, we offer a wizard to generate really precise digital map of the vineyard uh, and all static assets that are in it. And we also demonstrated the use of the assets map in application for tracking harvesting. And this is how it works. So mm, assets in the vineyard for which we know the precise location can also be tagged with RFID tags in order to create precise traceability of assets, such as, for example, grape crates. And we are today among the very first companies on the market offering grape tracking to a particular vine or group of vines and precise yield maps of manually picked grape um, using those technologies. Now, um, the maps that we produce are also, so both yield maps and um, vineyard asset maps are also interoperable through Atlas, so they can be consumed by other uh, Atlas compliant systems, uh, such as, for example, yeah, machinery and applications, which is opening a host of other possibilities. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you Matic for that great presentation and also to you Aurora. We now take five minutes to ask questions to both of your presentations and again participants use the chat function, ask all the questions you need to ask and I will try to read them out loud as they come through. All right, let's see what we have. Um, I see the first one to you Aurora. Regarding control of disease in organic vineyards, can the use of sensors permit to decrease the number of phytosanitary treatments? Thank you for the question. Uh, as we know, in the organic vineyard, the uh, must uh, require strict rules concerning the uh, phytosanitary treatments. Um, the uh, substances are alloyed only uh, from organic sources. Uh, so, uh, if you have more information uh, about uh, the status uh, health of the plant, uh, where and when we can uh, apply this treatment, uh, it will be very useful for uh, the uh, viticultural uh, farmers. Um, uh, the use of sensors, uh, such as um, uh, those uh, who measure the leaves humidity, or uh, sensors placed on uh, weather station uh, that are uh, linked with uh, applications that uh, give us prediction about uh, infections of plants, uh, can help uh, us to decrease the uh, number of uh, treatment that uh, in the, the rainy period uh, can arrive uh, um, up to 20 per uh, vegetative period. And in this way, we can decrease this number of treatment uh, up to six to eight treatments. So the use of sensor is very useful for uh, organic vineyard system. All right, great. Thank you, Aurora. 
Um, I see another one to you, Matic. What are the main challenges you have encountered besides the ones described in your presentation? Uh, so, yeah, definitely the currently fragmented ecosystem um, will need to somehow converge around common data structures and interfaces um, at least to a certain degree. And I think uh, the work done here in Atlas is addressing a real problem in that. Um, so, yeah, the actual adoption between the, like, of, yeah, the Atlas standards will probably take some time between the different systems. Um, but yeah, it will be really important for for this to be made attractive also to different industry players with very tangible benefits. So um, that would... Great, yeah. thank you, Matic. And this one goes to you, Aurora. What can you tell us about the Smart Vineyard concept? Uh, yes, it's a fashion concept uh, meet uh, nowadays. That it doesn't mean that the plants are smarter, <laughs> unfortunately. But uh, the use of uh, modern means that are uh, as uh, robots, that are sensor, internet of things, uh, satellite imagery, can help us to manage uh, the vineyard. In this way, we can uh, decrease the human labor. We know that we have a problem with uh, to find uh, human labor in our day, and also to decrease the inputs in uh, the, uh, our vineyards. Wonderful, Aurora, that was really great. Um, Matic, what would you say, you have mentioned that most of today's software systems don't support vine level. Do you see other vineyard management software vendors working in the same direction? And I think this is a bit related to this interoperability concept that we are constantly mentioning. So what would you say, Maric? Yeah. Uh, so there are some really progressive companies around the world, uh, largely in Australia, where they are on national level uh, trying to map things down to higher precision than block level for various reasons. Um, and they are working also in that direction. Um, and yeah, we are actually working hard with, with some of those companies on common descriptions of this data, also in an open source uh, way, trying to ensure that in the end, all the work that is being done, for example, here in Atlas, as well as elsewhere, uh, converges around some yeah, common interoperability schemes that we are uh, yeah, defining here in Atlas. Um, so yes, there is work being done in that direction, definitely. Uh, but it's yeah, slowly, slowly progressing, or at the, at the start, at the moment. Right. And speaking of this, there is another question linked to this one. Where did you discover the main value that interoperability of precise vineyard maps offer to the pilot? Yeah. So um, defining the best way to describe the map and. Um, yeah, obviously make it interoperable was a great concern. Uh, and we saw already in the, in the pilot location, uh, Jojo's Vineyard in the UK, um, they were piloting many different systems, including, for example, systems using cameras and drones um, and similar things. And we see that the biggest value can be created when the data from all of those systems can be then actionably used in, in all of those solutions. So, um, yeah, definitely the common um, common maps that are interoperable again um, provide the baseline for yeah addressing um, this let's say value creation from different systems. Wonderful. Thank you both. Thank you very much for your answers. And I think it's now time to wrap up this session and let's take a break. I think everyone can now go and grab a coffee tea, stretch your legs, um, and we will see you back in 10 minutes. However, be before you do so, we would like to uh, get your feedback on the following question that we have prepared uh, via Paul. And you can see it now in the chat uh, or on the screen. Um, it would only take you two seconds. So please, if you could take these two seconds before you go or during the break or after, and then I will make sure to report this back um, when we are back. Um, I think we are when are we back? 35, right? 11.35, I think. That was scheduled, but 
Anyway, you can take um, 10 minutes break and then you will see me in the screen and then is when we start with the next sessions. So great, we are seeing a lot, we are already seeing answers, so that's great. But again, I will officially report back um, after the break. See you in a bit, bye. Great, we are back and we hope you had enough time to relax and also answer our question. Uh, we've been following what you've been answering and as of now, we can see that more than 50% are happy or find that the challenges presented thus far were relevant. So that's really good news. And, um, but we still see that some of you still find this quite a bit relevant and a few of you don't find this relevant. So we hope that the next part, which will also be composed by joint sessions of our innovation hubs and open call winners, hopefully these challenges and their solutions will be even more relevant than what we have offered to you so far. All right, so as you can see now again in the chat, the agenda will be there uh, again so that you can follow exactly what's coming next, all the particulars. And we will have, as I said, these two presentations, um, um, two more joint sessions from the Innovation Hubs and um, our Open Call winners. And they will also showcase how they have implemented their innovative solutions to their agricultural challenges. Right, right after the presentations, uh, you will also see it again that we will run a panel discussion on a very exciting but sometimes controversial topic on the value uh, of data. So please stay put. And without further ado, we will now continue with the uh, next presentation after the break, and that is led by Peteris Skrastins and Janis Ausans from our Latvian Innovation Hub. Gentlemen, over to you. Hello, everyone. Seems it's uh, our turn. And uh, in our presentation, we will introduce to you our Atlas Latvia Innovation Hubs. Our partner, Janis from Association of Organic Agriculture will guide you through what had been done from our side. Please, Janis. Thank you, Petris, and hello, everyone. Let's go on with our presentation. We are three project partners involved in running of innovation hubs in Latvia. Latvian Fruit Growers Association a leading NGO in horticulture and gardening. Institute of Horticulture, they are part of Latvia State University of Life Sciences and Technologies specialized in horticulture. And Association of Latvian Organic Agriculture, leading NGO in organic farming. Sets of meteo and environment data sensors have been installed in five farms within Atlas project. Smart, sensor-based agriculture is in early stages in our region, especially in gardening and horticulture. Ideas of Atlas Innovation Hubs were something new and challenging for us. Therefore, we are trying to get as much benefits as possible. Here are a list of sensors we have installed. As you can see, besides typical meteo sensors, we also included sensors that can be used for forecasting, decision-making and scientific purposes. Arosa R Ltd is a family farm that is engaged in cultivation of blueberries in several excavated and recultivated peat bog fields. The company was founded in 2001. Currently, the plantations cover more than 70 hectares. Farm Eglai is producing and selling apples for more than 20 years, managing 12 hectare apple orchard that is considered to be one of the most beautiful in Latvia. It expands in the highly area of Kurzeme. Although the organic certified area of farm Puteni is only 8 hectares, farm produces a wide range of products. Apples, pears, pumpkins, onions, beets, various cabbages, lettuce and even sweet corn. Farm is also engaged in beekeeping. Since 2011, Kruagzama LTD has been growing black currant planting material and setting up black currant commercial gardens. In cooperation with researchers, Kruagzama LTD is working on improving black currant growing technologies, developing business plans for black currant commercial plantations, as well as consulting all that are interested in. Very Berry was established in 1997. In 17 years, berry plantations have reached 38 hectares. 
20 of them are cranberries, 12 hectares blueberries in several excavated and recultivated pea bug fields, 5 hectares raspberries and 1 hectare of rhubarb plantations. Sensors are connected to producerscloudweatherling.com. Farmers can see and control their gardens via laptop and mobile device. Base station with data logger and field nodes are produced by Davis Instruments. Not all sensors are made by Davis. Therefore, we hope an Atlas platform cooperation to solve compatibility problems between different sensor producers as we had some problems with interoperability between Davis data logger and sensors from other manufacturers. For software developers, it's possible to get data history in CSV or have JSON access to cloud for REST API. One of the problems to promote benefits from IoT sensors is that it is necessary to do registration with weatherling.com. Also, viewing history at weatherling.com website is with limited access. To get more benefits from sensor sets, not only for farmers, but for any stakeholder, we embed some data in our homepage. Now, everyone can see public current measurements of sensors as well as data history. What our farmers and other stakeholders expect from Atlas Innovation Hubs? We made a survey and got approximately 200 responses. Farmers are interested in following. First, learnable plug-and-play type equipment that can be installed and maintained themselves. Second, easy and understandable data overview. The advisory app recommends actions and enables decision-making processes. Farmers have no time to analyze massive data files and multicolor graphics. Here you can see our vision how IoT outputs should look for end-user, farmers. This is something like traffic light system easy understandable for farmers and helping to make decisions. Thank you, Yanis. And uh, that's all we wanted to share with you today. Thank you for your attention and uh, back to studio. Thank you. Thank you both, uh, Janis and Peteris, for offering this extensive overview of the Latvian, Latvian Innovation Hub. Our next presentation is from Denise Vicino, who will describe Chet Electronics as one of our successful first open call winners from last year. Denise, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Hello, everybody. I'm going to present you our company, Chat Electronics, and the Aurora for Atlas project about the pest management in viticulture. Our company is located in the northeast of Italy. It was founded in the 70s, so historically we have a great expertise in the design and production of electronic and software solutions for uh, several applications to the industry and more recently applied also to agriculture. We are focused on viticulture because we are in the Prosecco region, so we are surrounded by vineyards here. Our activities nowadays are mostly focused on uh, research and development applied to precision farming. Our challenge is to optimize the use of pesticides. It is a very well known issue for the sustainability of agriculture. And the answer, according to us, is to use these products only when it is really needed by the crop condition. Our solution is an IoT system made of hardware and software components. We have some uh, sensors located in the fields to collect data about uh, the climate, about uh, the soil conditions, and also about uh, the canopy growth, which is quite a new feature of this system. Data are then visualized through a, blood, a web platform, and they are elaborated to give uh, a decision support to the farm. And so elaborating a decision about uh, applying or not the plant protection products. From the hardware point of view, this is a set of sensors of our own development. We have a weather station with some uh, uh, novel features like a leaf wetness sensor integrated with the water drip detection. We have a stereo camera integrated in the station for vegetation measurements. We have uh, also climate sensors inside the canopy. Um, soil moisture sensor, especially one for uh, measurements at the superficial level, which is used in some specific disease models. 
And uh, in the end, we have also an electronic uh, trap for monitoring the, bug, uh, the bugs uh, captures at a distance. Let's focus a bit on the stereo camera, which is quite an innovative instrument. It has an automatic protection of the lenses, and the stereo vision allows a three-dimensional reconstruction of the canopy. This is indeed the three-dimensional profile that you can appreciate in this rendering. While here you have a daily elaboration by the image analysis software, above there is an automatic uh, recognition of the canopy and a measurement of the projected leaf surface. On the bottom, you have a depth view of the canopy, so a three-dimensional colored profile by which we measure the canopy volume. This data about the canopy and all the climate data are used for modeling the pathogens and thus providing forecasting about the infection of some diseases. Here we have a model specialized for downy mildew and we are working also with powdery mildew. Interesting new variables are making these models very reliable. In the end, this is our trap to monitor the insects. It's a pheromone trap integrated with a high resolution camera. From the images the, and the software analysis made it possible to recognize automatically the insects and to count them day by day. So to sum up, this is the um, representation of our project in Atlas. So we have four services provided by us for bug monitoring, canopy monitoring disease models, and we have opened up this system to an interoperability framework. It means that our outputs are now available in a standardized form for any other data consumer. And we have also worked on the standardization of the inputs used for our services so that they can be provided by any other data provider. I'm going to conclude with a list of benefits. First of all, the saving in plant protection products between 15 and 30 percent according to the climate and the environment. This, of course, means a lower impact on the environment, but also means to have uh, other uh, opportunity like uh, a more informed management of the farm, so a better quality and quantity uh, possible in the yield of the crop, a saving time in decision making, in general, increased value of the final products for the farmer. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, the interoperability feature, which is the main uh, novel feature gained uh, in our uh, uh, system thanks to the Atlas project, which uh, was really necessary to overcome in order to make the farming technology spread more uh, easily. I am done. Thank you very much for your attention and back to the studio. Brilliant. Thank you, Denise. I think that was a great example of how to face challenges related to weed and pest control. We will now see, hi both, we will now see how many questions we get to, to your presentations. So let's see how many. So please, again, use the chat. Uh, I will go and read them out loud and I will try to do my best to get to all of you, but hopefully, um, yeah, I'm not sure if I will manage with everything, but we'll do our best. I see the first one to you, Denise. So the question says, what is the value of measuring the veg vegetation? How can you use this data for? Yes, uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, well, the measurement of the vegetation is uh, quite a new feature that uh, we are able to get with our system. And it, use, it is used mainly for the fine tuning of uh, some disease models. For example, the Doni mildew model that we have uh, developed. This is because uh, when we have some uh, new leaf tissue, this is much more uh, sensitive. This is much more exposed to the risk of infection. So it's really uh, important to quantify this uh, new vegetation because uh, in such a way we can uh, um, uh, quantify better let's say, the probability of infection. So our forecasts of the model are more uh, accurate in this sense. Also, we use this information uh, to provide the model for the concentration of plant protection products in the that uh, we can get a distribution of the leaf uh, ages uh, on the canopy and uh, by tracking the history of uh, plant protection products application uh, 
can derive a model of their uh, dilution on the canopy. So we can better suggest when it is really needed to enter in the field with a new phytosanitary treatment. And last but not least, I would say you can use this data um, as an average uh, data about development of the canopy in your field to quantify the dose, the volume of the plant protection products uh, missed to spray in the field. So essentially these three aspects are, are very important. Great, thank you, Denise. We, um, the participant asks, is it useful to spend money for such systems in fruit vegetable farms in East and North European regions? What would you say to that? Okay, uh, thank you for question. Uh, it's true that uh, irrigation and uh, plant protection uh, chemicals in uh, East, North Europe uh, need less than in South Europe. Yeah, it's true. But um, the climate change and uh, uh, those things uh, become actual also in our area, so North East. So, for example, um, this year uh, was very dry and hot in our area and um, on soft berry fields uh, only those farmers who had uh, uh, sensor technologies had normal crops uh, ones who don't have uh, lose much money some of them even to 100 thousand euros so uh, atlas and smart tech uh, is actual also for our uh, northeast region Wonderful, thank you, Peteris. Um, Denise, this one goes to you. Are your services adaptable to other crops besides grapevines? Uh, yes, uh, so regarding the climate data, I would say that they are, they are uh, adaptable, of course, to any other crop. Vegetation detection and measurement, uh, since it is a composite, um, it must be uh, trained for the recognition and the quantum of the canopy of other kinds of cultures. Nowadays, uh, we have uh, completed uh, this uh, service for the vineyard, but also for the kiwi fruit uh, orchards, and uh, we are extending it to uh, pear and apple tree at the moment. But uh, in principle, this can be done for any other crop uh, of interest. Uh, it just takes the time to develop the, the training of the image analysis system, essentially. Great, I see. All right, thank you, Denise. Um, Peteris, is the smart agriculture useful for smaller farms? Large farms can invest in expensive systems and investment pay pays off. But for smaller fruit farms, does the investment really pay off? Uh, thank you. This is a very usual question for us from our farmers. But um, basic uh, portable uh, meteor stations are not very expensive. They are below a thousand euros. So, and in a previous answer, I already mentioned some uh, economical aspects. So, even you get only a few tons more product uh, due to smart systems, you, your investment uh, already retrieves. Hope I answer. Right, thank you, Peteris. And again, this one goes for you. Is your innovation hub, which is placed in fruit a vegetable farm, is it useful to visit those demo farms to other farmers with similar purposes? Uh, that's also a good question, uh, but uh, principles of uh, sensor operation are the same in, uh, in any field. So. Uh, this is one of uh, Atlas targets that uh, different uh, IoT sensors can work uh, on different fields, uh, same way. So if you are, for example, grain grower, you can also come to learn uh, the operating of Atlas principles in our innovation hubs, even they are in, uh, in fruit and vegetable fields. All right, I hope everybody heard that well. And let's wrap up this with you, Denise. Um, have you already had requests from your customers for interfacing your services to other technologies as provided by Atlas? Yes, we already had, uh, I would say, tons of, of uh, requests in this sense. So requests of interfacing our 
hardware devices, our sensors, and also our software services uh, to other systems. But at the moment, all the requests were, were quite, uh, um, I mean, tailored to uh, some specific te technology. So we had to adapt our communication protocols specifically for some other technologies. And uh, I will say that this is, uh, was a great opportunity us as a project to create some uh, standards in, the, in this kind of communication in interface with other technologies. So it is really making the life much more uh, simple in the interoperability sense. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you both. I think we are now done with this uh, part and let's move on now to the next joint session, which is the final one. Uh, on this occasion, we will have an innovation hub coming from Switzerland. His name is Peter Froglich from the Froglich Farm, and he would be showcasing this farm. So, Peter, without further ado, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Great to be here. My name is Peter Froglich, and I'm presenting you the Swiss innovation hub on Froglich Farms. So Furley Farms is a small farm, it's close to Zurich Airport. And actually, when we look at digitalization and also digital means and data farming, there's not yet the focus on small farms, small farms, meaning farms below something like 30 hectares. And that's actually where we also should have a voice as farmers, because that reflects most of the global farming structures. So many farms are having that size or are even smaller and we want to try products on these farms and on those sizes and that's why we have the swiss innovation hub in atlas the farm has a number of challenges that you don't see everywhere around so we have lots of uh, different field shapes you see it here you almost not finding a rectangular field so it's quite different to what you might see in bigger structures. There's uh, actually forest uh, edges, there's uh, hedgerows, there's a small river going through it. Then there are actually slopes up to 25% um, and very different soils. You see it here already in the picture. We have like from uh, light soils or lighter soils with around 10% of clay to actually over 40%. Uh, so very different um, kind of conditions to test different things. You see it here, it's in a small kind of valley. Um, that's also very nice. So if you want to test stuff, you're happily welcome here in Switzerland. Um, definitely it's a countryside to be enjoyed. And again, you see here the slopes, you see the shadows of the forest. In, you don't see the different soil now too much, but it's there, I can assure you. So really good conditions to test. What are our challenges? Um, what we see is that uh, small farms, they usually, and also in our case, we do not have a specific innovation infrastructure or actually innovation um, that we can provide to you. So we really need to accommodate each one um, and check out what can be possible. Though we have different running projects uh, for biodiversity, for technology, and that all needs to be coordinated. And um, there might be conflicts in some cases, but we will make sure that uh, we find a way to actually address what we need to do. Then, and I think that's the biggest thing, uh, today's machines and uh, all digital technologies, they're really focused on bigger farms. So being a farm with around uh, 27 hectares, so below 30, that's quite a challenge for many things to be economically viable. So it's a very good point here to test it and to see what's working, what's also financially working in such an environment. And definitely we have some use cases uh, in the Atlas that are with us. Um, so I would like to show what we do today. So we had some shifting around 
We have use cases to test on task management. That's what we're already doing here on the farm. Um, we have different equipment where we test different application maps and types of application maps. We then have uh, orchards here. So we are testing also plant protection application on the farm. We do that also on a different test farm close to us. It's like 40 minutes away where there's all the infrastructure for orchard testing. We then have definitely the use case on fertilization. We have complemented that one with actually um, one use case around uh, drilling densities, which to us goes in combination with fertilization. So we have one nice use case here in cereals. And then last but not least, we also looked into um, platoon management, but that's one that we actually had to had to, to cancel. So, but quite a number of um, test cases we have here already, and we are happy to welcome more. If you have ideas, contact us and we will make sure we can accommodate you. Um, so benefits will be to better understand novel digital technologies, to be actually more independent with testing and uh, having a more open approach with Atlas and also the understanding of the technical solutions on the Swiss farms. And uh, that's actually what I wanted to show you. So thanks a lot for listening to us and hope to welcome you on the Swiss uh, Innovation Hub one day. Great, thank you, Peter. That was very informative and I'm sure many participants will feel related to the challenges that you have showcased and therefore find your solutions very relevant. If you have any questions for Peter, take the opportunity now and use the chat function to ask him questions and then we will um, use this space to ask them directly at the questions and answers session. Now let's move on to the next open call winner's presentation based in Serbia. That is, Senka Gahinov will explain us the biggest tie successful use case on their solutions for livestock managing, fo focusing on pig production. Over to you, Senka. Thank you, ladies, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to introduce to you a solution for livestock management with specific focus on pig production. However, first, let me introduce ourselves. We are Dunamnet, a company from Serbia designing turnkey solutions for sustainable living and farming based on IoT and AI technologies. We love challenges and enjoy solving problems. We love working with farmers and enjoy eating the food they produce. We rely on a strong ecosystem comprising stakeholders from across the agri-food supply chain. Thanks to the collaboration with Atlas, we are extending our portfolio of smart agricultural solutions and preparing the company for participation in an open agriculture data space, as well as expanding our network of partners leveraging the Atlas ecosystem and outreach. After many hours spent with farmers discussing the main problems they are facing, in addition to the ability to continuously monitor environmental conditions and be notified in case of events requiring attention, we identified that the animal well-being is a very important issue, both from the compliance with the legislations and the requirements of stakeholders' points of view. Monitoring the animal growing process, estimation of the weight, as well as early detection of changes in animal behavior are aspects having impact on multiple stakeholders in the value chain. One can say that farmers want to know if their pigs are healthy and happy, and that is what we are trying to provide with the pig sty service. Pigs were not our first animals. We started with the chickens more than three years ago. We've created machine learning algorithm to detect chickens, to estimate their size and weight, and are learning about their behavior. And then we scaled up the machine learning algorithms and trained machines to detect pigs as well. First, the algorithm was trained to recognize pigs, and then we extended it to be able to measure dimensions of the pigs as a step towards estimating their weight. How we did this? First, we deployed devices in a pig barn at pilot site in Serbia, one of the leading pig farms in the region. 
We installed the devices for measuring air temperature and humidity, CO2 at the ammonia level, as well as video cameras for monitoring animals and their behavior. With more than four months of collecting video recordings, we've extracted lots of images and did the manual annotation to train the system how to recognize pigs. The process was very time consuming, but at the end, the results made us happy. We've created the machine learning algorithm for recognition of the pigs, calculation of their size, and for tracking of their movement. We implemented required Atlas interfaces and data formats to enable usage of our machine learning model by other partners from the Atlas ecosystem, contributing to the creation of interoperable smart agriculture and livestock solutions and potentially expanding our user base. Going forward, the work done in Pig's Tie project will be used as the basis for creation of a line of animal well-being features and features enabling optimization of other processes in the value chain. And speaking about farmers and benefits and what uh, they can expect, the ability to not only continuously monitor environmental and operational conditions, the growth process and the animal activities, but also to receive automatically generated insights and recommendations lead to an optimized farm operation and improved animal well-being setting up the basis for increased transparency of the food supply chain and eventually increased trust of the consumers. And that brings us to the end of my presentation. We are happy, the pigs are happy, and I hope our users will be happy as well. For more details, please visit our website. Thank you very much for your attention. Me and my colleague look forward to answering your questions. Back to you, ladies. Great, wonderful, Senka. Thank you very much. I think this is a very relevant topic from your use case, and I'm sure many, many participants will find this extremely relevant. Now, let's finish off these joint sessions with Dietrich Kortenbruck from EXA Computing in Germany, who will offer you their exemplary project with efficient and transparent nutrient cycle reporting. Dietrich, the floor is yours. Hi everybody, my name is Didi Kornbrock and I'm the CEO of Exa Computing GmbH and I'm happy to be here today with you and the uh, team of Atlas to uh, show you our uh, project in the Atlas Movement Call 2020. What we did is a, a little project uh, which is about the uh, efficient and transparent nutrient cycle reporting, which means that we try to um, take the data streams from the farm and use it to analyze the, the logistic processes on a specific farm. And uh, so what, what uh, is the problem um, about us? We are Exatrack and we are providing a connectivity solution for agricultural machine fleets of different age and manufacturer, which means that we can uh, take a fleet on a specific farm and we can uh, all the machines into one cloud platform to record uh, the data from this these machines. All the data uh, can be acquired in one single solution, the Exatrack portal, and this means that it can be machine data, but as well the as applied data from the implement, uh, for example, sensors, seeders, manure spreaders, whatever. And uh, very important for us, of course, are the interfaces to initiatives as the Atlas platform, because our customers want to take that data and process it in further software services, for example, a billing for billing purposes or for uh, accounting or farm management, whatever. What are the challenges in this in this area? So uh, logistic processes in agriculture are very hard to capture because there are so many involved parties. You have uh, machines on the field that are harvesting uh, or applying uh, some goods on the field. These vehicles in the field are supported by in-field logistic vehicles, which are transporting the goods from the field to the field border to the vehicle which is applying, or from the from the harvester to the field border where another logistic vehicle is waiting for the transfer between field and farm. 
there are waiting bridges involved for precise acquisition of the quantities and uh, there can be further sensors for example near sensors to uh, acquire the quality of the good you're transporting and uh, to enable the full retraceability of data from multiple sources must be combined uh, before the output can be calculated and uh, the data in this pro project should be available with an atlas to allow further services based on that uh, reporting. So what did we do? We uh, in this project developed um, this small small communication unit. You can see there uh, right beneath to the, the waiting computer. And this module can set up a data connection between um the waiting computer and the tractor that's uh, outside on the waiting bridge so um this is what what we did here in the hardware part and, and software our firmware part and then of course we did the implementation of the atlas service within the atlas network to exchange the acquired data with uh with other atlas services and my colleague uh, frederick he was outside in the field on the demo farm and uh, he was there to show us how it works outside. So now we are here in the scale office. Uh, at the screen of the computer we see all machines who drive in the corn harvesting uh, today. Um, all machines get installed with our T2 modules. So we see here um, where they drive and we get the data. Above the screen we see the screen of the scale uh, who is installed here at the farm and we have installed at the um, scale our V1 module and uh, with the V1 module um, we've installed these uh, traffic lights so if a machine or a vehicle drives on the scale, the traffic lights is turned off and the V1 module get connected to the T2 module and the traffic light turns red. At the next step, our V1 module sends the white of the vehicle to our T2 module on the machine and the traffic light turns green. If the light uh, turns green or lightning green, the Lightning is finished and the machine can uh, continue. Yeah, here now you can see beautifully how the tractor uh, goes onto the wedding bridge and sets up the connection and instantly the uh, weight of the vehicle is sent to the cloud and available for other services. So many thanks, Felix, for this small introduction. So what are the benefits for the for the farmer? Um, the data from machines, waiting bridges, and the near sensor, for example, if we're talking about nutrients, can be acquired in a single solution. ExaTrack is handling the connectivity on machine or sensor level, uh, which allows a simple retrofit on all the machines. And all the data, is instantly available in Atlas for other Atlas services. I think uh, I made a little introduction into our project. Many, many thanks for your time. If you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to contact me. And many thanks to the Atlas team as well. Great. Thank you, Titik. And I think your last slide with the benefits uh, prove very clearly why our MVTs should also join the Atlas network to exchange the data there and make use of this data. All right. Uh, let's uh, wrap up now this session. We may have now a bit more time than usually because we have three presentations. So please continue submitting your questions and I will report them back to our speakers. So let's see how many we get for this one. Oh, I see many of them coming through. Um, okay, this one is for Dietrich. Um, why do you install extra hardware on the machines instead of using the manufacturer's cloud interfaces? 
Yeah, many thanks. In um, agriculture, we have the the yeah, problem. Can you hear me? That yes, um, uh, we have the fact that machines are used quite long, uh, even on smaller farms, or especially on smaller farms, you have uh, quite a long time, eight years, up to twelve years, uh, where until the machine is exchanged, and uh, after that time, of course, not all the the whole fleet is exchanged, but you have. Um, maybe one machine which is exchange and two years later another machine so you need um, to separate the data acquisition from the hardware from the tractor to have a yeah re reliable data acquisition um, on your farm so we are providing these hardware modules which you can install on the on the new tractor you just purchased um, but as well you can you can install it on the old old tractor 10 15 20 years or maybe which you are still using for some some special tasks on your farm, and you have a real reliable single source of uh, data for that um, for for your farm. And another thing is that sometimes some manufacturers are limiting the data um, they are making available to their customers via those services because they're um, they regard it as confidential. And some of this data is really uh, needed by the farmers, and uh, it, it shouldn't be the case that this is, um, yeah, h hidden by the manufacturers. Great, wonderful, Dietrich. Very, very insightful. Um, Senka, this one goes to you. How complicated is to customize your service for another animal species? Yeah, well. Uh... From one hand, we can say it's not a big deal. It's not too complicated for us. But on the other hand, uh, we actually first uh, uh, set up a good basis uh, to have a machine learning algorithm that uh, can uh, detect chickens for the beginning. And then uh, we scaled up the algorithm for uh, detecting pigs. And uh, now we can use uh, that machine learning algorithm uh, to actually to be scaled up for any type of animals, but uh, for the beginning uh, and uh, always is a big deal to collect enough data and uh, to actually uh, install devices for uh, collecting data. And uh, that is a very challenging part uh, of uh, the whole process. And uh, when uh, we succeed in this part, then uh, scaling up the algorithm is something that uh, is uh, uh, doable in uh, not uh, in very uh, well, very fast, let's say like that. Uh, and uh, further analysis and uh, further procedure depends on the needs of the producers and uh, problems that needs to be solved and the uh, specification of animals and so on. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Senka. Um, Peter, this one is for you. What technologies do you think will fit for smaller farms? Well, what we see is that uh, most technologies that are out there are just very big so uh, and very expensive. So I think what fits is something that's financially and economically viable, where the investment, especially upfront investment, is not too big. Uh, so we look into things like, like actually smaller functional robots we could use uh, for certain jobs and um, I think also a big thing here is solutions that can be retrofitted on on existing on existing machines because that's the most viable way for actually smaller farms to be to be used and, and to be moved uh, to move forward. Also, things like um, softwares that can be run on mobile phones. Uh, I think such approaches are very interesting for smaller farms like uh, us here. Wonderful. And we have actually another one for you. Uh, when are the next Atlas activities planned in Froglick Farm? Well, we have uh, several activities ongoing, especially around uh, application map creation. We have this targeted fertilization use case where we are creating 10 by 10 meter 
uh, application maps and uh, we are testing those. We see the limits of current technologies. I mean, most terminals fold when we upload what we have today. So we, we are really trying to figure ways how we can get around today's technologies to, to make it work, um, which is not easy. And so based on this, there will be more with um, with targeted fertilization in spring, so February, March. And yeah, then there is targeted orchard application starting from April onwards. And next to this, we have biodiversity projects um, on the farm uh, where we measure biodiversity and um, also soil improvements. So that goes all in parallel currently. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Dietrich, what services do you think would be possible by combining data from the different sources? There are at the moment many, many, many areas in, in which um, combining the data of these sources can provide benefit. For example, one big field is the, the yeah, stricter governmental rules uh, that are applied all over Europe, but as well in other parts worldwide. Um, that you have to document transfers of nutrients or goods from one farm to another within only a couple of days sometimes, depending on the region we are living. Um, you have as well to document very carefully what nutrients you are applying uh, on what field, um, even on a, on a power feed level, uh, because you sometimes have strict stricter rules uh, because there's maybe some, some rivers uh, or something like this. And of course, uh, this is not only in the uh, agronomical part of the of the farm, but as well in the economical um, management of your farm, where you want to like uh, use data for automated billing of machine operations, for example, between different parts of your farm, and sometimes you just. Uh, yeah, you want to to reduce workload on your management team um, in terms of the daily organization of work. So, which means uh, just simple cases like you're reducing, you're reducing um, phone calls for for the organization, and uh, that's all services that are only possible if you have a reliable data source. And uh, very important as well here, um, this data needs to come from every machine you're using in that specific company or on the farm. Because if you can only cover half of the fleet, um, it's not worth using such a solution. All right. Then your message has been heard, uh, hopefully also for the audience that uh, will note this down. And Senka, what is the advantage for service development within Atlas? Uh, well, cooperation uh, with, uh, Atl with other services under, under, uh, <laughs> sorry, under Atlas ecosystem uh, actually was the great benefit as we got the opportunity to connect uh, with the Atlas storage service and to use video stored there, which uh, otherwise we couldn't uh, use and those uh, video recordings uh, actually we were used for validating our fixed eye service and uh, that is uh, the great uh, benefit actually and uh, additional opportunity to participate in making uh, such a template of, for, for livestock monitoring and uh, use it as a basis for creating a different uh, animal welding feature is uh, another great uh, uh, benefit and uh, after all, uh, having uh, uh, the large Atlas ecosystem uh, is a great opportunity, uh, additional opportunity for us uh, for, for promotion of our service. And uh, that is uh, a really good uh, advantage as well. Right. And Senka, let's wrap up this with you. What were the challenges in setting up different devices on the farm? Well, that was really challenging. <laughs> when uh, you're going on farms, uh, then uh, that is a uh, world for itself. Uh, first of all, we had, uh, uh, well, I, well not, not to mention challenge uh, because uh, there were African uh, swine fever happening uh, in the time when we 
position devices uh, at the farm and then uh, COVID restrictions and everything. So uh, everything uh, let us waiting a little more. But uh, after all, uh, beside this positioning of devices is something uh, which is very challenging because you have to position devices uh, in uh, production bars uh, uh, to provide the most accurate measurements because on top of those measurements, we are building our solutions. So positioning uh, devices for monitoring the environmental condition is uh, one thing. And then uh, very challenging is uh, finding a, a right way to position or right position of camera, a right angle to, to, to be able to use video recordings from the camera to train the machine learning algorithm to be able to detect uh, animals, but not just to detect them, and, and, uh, but, but to uh, monitor their behavior and uh, to be able, uh, after all, to do behavior analysis and uh, provide uh, more information to the end users. So uh, then uh, uh, Wi-Fi connectivity uh, was uh, and sometimes is a problem in, uh, uh, in a farm. But uh, after all, all those uh, issues and challenges uh, are fixed. And uh, then you have uh, just uh, one that can't be fixed, and that is actually something that we realized when our colleagues uh, come back to the office after installing devices and that was a specific smell that they have so we all avoid to be there in, in uh, very near to them and talk to them for a few hours or maybe a few days wonderful vital hints for the audience to know this um, we still have time for a final question and I will ask you, Peter, what projects do you have running on the farm already? Uh, yeah, so we have the project around fertilization. Um, and also we have the project on drilling density maps. Um, so there's, there's a few running here. I think that's, that's the main ones we focus now on. Also, there's the targeted uh, orchard application where we had first tests last year in August, and this shall continue this spring, uh, or actually spring 2022. And uh, yeah, then there's the biodiversity project running. So this is what we have in parallel here next to start building all the interactions for the hub. Right, sorry, that was overlapping a bit with the previous question, but I need to scan them uh, quite quickly. All right, thank you all. Uh, we will now move on to the next uh, item in the agenda, and that is the panel discussion. I will now turn the moderating role over to our Atlas partner and CEO of Fodjan, Karsten Giesler, who will be chairing the discussion on the value of data to answer the question, is data the new oil? The panel is comprised by very relevant panelists from other similar projects and a wide range of backgrounds, expertise and experiences in the agricultural sector. Please enjoy the next half an hour and over to you, Karsten. So hello together um, to our panel discussion. It's, uh, Pleasure to have all of you here. So first, I'd like to introduce myself a bit further, so since I already said something. So I'm a CEO of um, Fodian, one of the um, partners in Atlas, and yeah, working on all agricultural connecting parts, in, especially in feeding. And so that's, yeah, that's quite interesting role, but even more interesting to connect all that, that good project in Atlas and I'm working on the future um in agriculture so um yeah and so i would hand over to all um attendees and say okay also a short introduction on your side so just some sentences what have you done and why are you here maybe or yeah so who will start just open i can start okay can you hear me yeah Okay, fine. Yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Mariana Faraldi. Uh, I'm here today with a double role. So on one side, I'm here in a representation of OpenDI project, uh, which is a CSA uh, financed under uh, Horizon 2020 uh, research program. And uh, the main goal of this project is that to support large scale pilots, so innovation actions uh, in reaching their goals. So we try in some way to 
uh, favorite to create this kind of knowledge uh, sharing and discussion between uh, different research researchers from different uh, projects. Mm, uh, I'm uh, here uh, also um, in representation of uh, Technoalimenti. Technoalimenti uh, is uh, a non-profit uh, uh, consortium, public-private, uh, uh, represented by the Ministry of Research in Italy and 31 food industries. And I'm a senior researcher. I'm working there since uh, 20 years. Uh, I'm uh, uh, strongly involved uh, in different financed projects uh, uh, in strict contact uh, uh, with uh, uh, farmers and uh, food industry for uh, uh, innovation purposes. And currently I'm following some pilots and use cases. So in some way today I will uh, uh, try to share uh, my expertise in this, uh, in this field. Thanks to you. So um, next, please. So I can, I can continue. So hello, everyone. My name is Stefan Rilling. I work as a, a researcher and project manager for Fraunhofer Institute for Intelligent Analysis and Information Systems. Um, today, I'm here in the role as the uh, coordinator of the Atlas project. Uh, my background is uh, in computer science. I'm involved in uh, multiple projects all relating around data analysis and data visualization. Um, yeah, and I'm looking forward for the discussion. Okay, so, so now I to my turn. <laughs> I'm Oscar Garcia. I, uh, like Mariana, I'm here representing two different uh, roles. So first and um, most important role here is uh, I'm the uh, lead of uh, work package four in uh, within the Mirror pro, uh, project, which is uh, that uh, that work package is about a decision support system, uh, uh, helping the, the the farms and farmers uh, to take appropriate decisions when <coughs> when they have uh, many many data at their hand, uh, which is uh, coming out of different places around the, the farms. And also, I'm uh, operation director of uh, an ICT company, Information Catalyst, uh, where we uh, are helping different kinds of projects from different domains in, in extracting knowledge and leveraging their data to, to extract value and, and then returning that into, into a profit for them. Thanks to you, Hans. Oh, we can't hear you so far. But maybe then we, we um, skip your introduction um, to some minutes later and start with the discussion. So, but, so you have some time and we um, can start with some other topics. And yeah, the topic today or the, is, um, is data the new oil? So and um, I asked myself, OK, is that right or not? And um, I think some years ago or last years, I thought, okay, clear, that's, a, that's an easy question to answer. Um, it's yes, because data is that important for future and yeah, but is it the new oil? And so today I have a bit another opinion. So I, I personally don't see that's really the new oil, but um, we will figure it out through the discussion. And for me, the big question is um, about value because um, of course, everybody knows um, digital or data is not black and clippery and can destroy the environment when it's on the wrong place. And it's, and also um, myself or also a lot of Atlas partners and other software um, companies in agriculture know um, it's also that um, way that just having data, um, you are not rich yeah, afterwards. When you really find a lot of oil and then it's quite easy to, um, to sell that. When you just find a huge amount of data, it's out of my opinion, not that easy to become that rich like an, um, yeah, like a really oil owner. But other sides also to think about maybe just my data is not big enough. Just to having a small um, yeah, oil resource in your garden is more an environmental catastrophe and not really a value. So that you need also bigger amounts. But um, yeah, let's start that discussion and it's it's all about value, I see. So we have to have something and you, you fi have to find people which are, which like to pay something for data, like a lot of people like to pay um, money for oil at the moment. We see that at the oil prices also. 
so that's um that's the question and so yeah let's start with that and uh, the question is first one um was to marina mariana sorry um is it really valuable for farmers to have data do they do they like that what is what's for you value out of data can you see that in the agriculture in the moment uh, uh, this is an interesting question, Karsten. So uh, I think that uh, uh, value is uh, uh, something uh, in the mind of IT people. I mean, uh, uh, farmers are, uh, according to my experience, uh, a little bit confused on this because uh, uh, are uh, re uh, really these uh, data a value for them? So data are data. So. Uh, if they have any sensor in the field, so uh, this sensor can provide uh, uh, a datum the same uh, uh, if they do uh, an analysis, for example, directly in the field or uh, along the supply chain, they can have a result. But uh, is really uh, valuable, uh, uh, these, uh, these data are really a, a value for them because uh, they read a lot into the into the scientific community discussions that uh, uh, big data the value of data but uh, according to my experience uh, this uh, is not perceived directly by farmers in this way so it would be fundamental to demonstrate to them uh, if uh, uh, there is a value and uh, in which form. So they need the practical examples, uh, for example, success stories uh, or uh, practical examples, because it, it is uh, interesting to learn from other experiences and in this way to understand that probably this is something that they can experience by themselves. So um, this is my perception. So. Uh, Technology providers, IT researchers, IT managers and people should stress a lot this value and uh, making farmers and food industry because uh, we have not to stop to the farmer because this is just the very preliminary phase of a, a, a whole supply chain which is involved because uh, we have to think that data should be shared along the supply chain for creating added value. So if uh, we are able in some way to demonstrate through practical examples, I think uh, this is um, very, very important. Ariana, for that, um, so I, I'm a bit remembered also to oil, honestly, because um, when we really see one barrel of raw oil, yeah, you can buy somewhere maybe, and then you have it, but it's worth nothing for the most people because then you have just raw oil. You can't put it in the engine. You can't drive carbon or tractor by that. It's just, um, yeah, it's just raw oil, a clippery, whatever quality. Um, and then you have to do something out of it. So it's like maybe like raw data. Just to have raw data is value nothing, really. It just costs you money to store it. But what can we do out of it uh, practically to, to come to that value? And so I like to pass over to Oscar. Can you give some examples where you see that we have that raw data that's um, where we really can find value in it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, I mean, in, in the middle, what we have is, uh, well, we have uh, the DSS uh, uh, component. It's composed of about 25, 26 co different components. And this range from evaluating the, uh, thanks to satellite, satellite images, the, the current status of the different uh, plants or crops, and then also some uh, image recognition to see whether uh, my my trees, my olive trees, for instance, are, uh, are having some kind of pests in there or detecting fruit flies or assessing how the, how the quality of, of the milk gathered in one week is 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 good enough or it's uh, uh <coughs> sorry and it's and it's getting the, the different standards that, that we try to sell i mean at the end of the day what we are trying to to put is all this data that it's already at the different farmers hands which is 
amount of milk, uh, how many olive trees I have, which is the status of the of the crops because I I can see them. Uh, it's just to put some automated tools on top of them, uh, like image recognition, uh, counting algorithms, or predictive or clustering or analyzing, and so on and so on and so on and so on, uh, to to provide to the to the farmer much more information than what they are currently having. Okay, so. Uh, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, having better data is always good, but having better knowledge is what is really making the difference, okay? So I can have the same set of data that my neighbor has, my farmer neighbor has, because I'm growing, I don't know, garlics, for instance. Uh, and, and then, uh, but because he's getting just more information about from weather stations or from uh, the quality of the water to, to, to irrigate the, the, the crops and uh, when is the best moment to, to uh, collect all the, the, the crops, the, the garlics in this case, uh, he is going to take a much more benefit than, than I take. Okay, so it's, it's uh, at the end of the day, uh, we try to summarize it pretty easy, I mean, it's all about data. Yes, it's all about data, but it's not all about data only. It's all about data, but it's all about the value that you can extract from them. Okay, and here is where uh, many algorithms uh, start to extract value from them. But then, at the end of the day, the, it's also uh, back to the to the farmer in the sense that he has to take. The right decisions when to uh, do different irrigation or when to do some nutrition and some fertilization because it's it's uh, the, the weather forecast says that there is going to be no wind and then uh, you can fertilize better because all your spray won't go other places and will stay in, in your plants Okay, so uh, so these these are typical examples that we are treating in, in the meter, and, and at the end of the day, uh, I uh, well we are still in testing phase in that sense, uh, uh, so we cannot provide uh, better numbers or or at least numbers uh, of the of the uh, of these validated uh, components, but but this is what we really are looking for. Karsten, I think that DSS is really uh, a good example on this because the farmer can uh, really see uh, an advantage for, uh, for them because uh, they provide data, maybe also historical data for training this DSS, but then they have a practical uh, implication, I mean a practical support for the daily and routinely um, activities uh, uh, in the in the field, and this is uh, this is uh, fundamental because it, it they they are happy in some way or available to invest in something because they can see uh, a support in their uh, decisions, uh, so that they can dedicate their time to do something else. So, I think this is a very very good uh, example. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. And that's um, with decision support systems. So that's, um, but it's, I, I also loved your example, Oscar, with the two farmers side by side. Um, all have the same data set, maybe, but it's afterwards really what to do with that and how to get the most out of it and how to use it in your practical um, way. So let's really also see that we really need to, to work on that data all together. Also, um, yeah technology and renters, but also the farmer in itself. It's not just having that, but you have really to, to use it and let you support by that support decision, decision support systems. It's not just just installing and then um, going away. So it's, um, yeah. And I'd like to, to pass over to Stefan. Do you have um, more examples where we see, okay, how can we make out of that raw um, data material some value or um, maybe practical from Atlas or something? Yeah. I mean, in, in general, we, we have to, to think think about one, or we have to imagine one, one thing, what, what would today's world be without any digital technology? So we, 
we have a lot of advantages coming out of data. And of course, there are disadvantages. Uh, we all, all know these. But in the end, all, all this digital technology uh, we have there and, and all the data which, which uh, comes, comes with it uh, makes our, our life easier and, and uh, uh, makes us more, more productive, more efficient. Um, and um, one example I have, I have in mind is uh, if you just think about, about uh, uh, weather forecasts uh, within the, the last uh, decades, uh, for, for sure that has, uh, 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 has been digitized a, a lot. If you, if you compare the number of, of weather stations you, you had 100 years ago or even, even 60 years ago, uh, to the amount of, of weather data you can get by, by sensor networks today, that, that's a real it's a amazing difference. And uh, having all that, that data at hand, uh, uh, allows for for weather forecast companies uh, to have really sophisticated sophisticated weather models and uh, to make uh, really really good predictions. I mean, uh, if you now look at the weather forecast, the online weather forecast, look how will the weather be in the next two two days, three days. Usually, you have a very very good accurate forecast, and uh, then uh, with the digital technology we have as end users at hand with smartphones, with, with uh, internet connections everywhere, we, we have access to, to that data. And we can now really, really uh, easily decide, okay, I'm doing field work tomorrow, it won't rain. And I can usually be quite sure that uh, the forecast is reliable and I do not risk too much. And if you compare that to the situation 30 years before, 50 years before, that is a real improvement. And that, that shows uh, uh, very good how, what value we can get out of digital data in our everyday life and, and with really simple things. Gaston, we cannot hear you. Sorry, I thought that. But um, that's, I like that. Um, that you also bring in the, the long-term part in it because it's um, not just by, okay, now we talk about digitization and tomorrow agriculture will be totally different. It's a long, long-term long um, development also, but it's, I think, like you also mentioned, it's um, has already started in agriculture. We see a lot of things, but it will remain that change. And it's not just by, okay, tomorrow we have it all. And we see that also in Atlas, it's not that easy to, to just make huge steps. You can imagine in practical, you're facing a lot of difficulties, but also facing a lot of possibilities and, and value. So in my daily work as well. So I'd like to hand over now to Stamatis. Hopefully we can hear you now. Yes, yes. So, yes, great. Um, um, so first, can me... you introduce yourself? Yeah. Yes, let me introduce myself. I'm uh, Stamatis Konomu. I'm a farmer, but uh, also I studied biology. And uh, I'm participating as a farmer in uh, Atlas project. And uh, I'm providing my fields in order to uh, install some instruments and uh, to make this uh, pilot uh, fields. He, uh, we have uh, our uh, fields uh, with uh, apples in uh, Aya, uh, Larissa, Greece. It's, uh, it is in uh, central Greece. Thanks. And also my, my first question to you, Samatis, um, it's or how much uh, the value of data. So how much money would you lose in your farm or is it even do you mention it when you stop to use digital um, yeah, solutions or even um, when you throw out your computer out of the window? So that's um, just because you're angry because something doesn't work. Um, but is that an expensive decision to throw the computer out or is it, um, is it just a hobby for a farmer like you to, to do digital things in the moment but not really valuable? Um, here in Greece, we, we are uh, uh, the we are small farmers and uh, it is really expensive to use 
all those uh, instruments. But if we are in a cooperation or if we can work with a municipality, these things can uh, help us uh, very much. Uh, and I think that uh, as a climate crisis is uh, ahead of us, uh, these uh, things uh, will be the future in agriculture. And uh, we can see that uh, these years uh, we have uh, many problems and many different problems, uh, such as uh, uh, that uh, the water sources are uh, limited. Maybe we have uh, uh, a high uh, temperature and in the summer, but also and in the high temperatures in the winter. And all of these things uh, will cost us uh, uh, much money. And uh, of course, uh, the production is uh, very low uh, some years. So if you can use all those uh, uh, informations, maybe we will be ready uh, to uh, reduce uh, the costs of uh, the climate uh, change. That's a very interesting point to, to bring also um, future um, issues or yeah, challenges for agriculture in place because that's, um, I think there's also a very interesting area for digitalization to bring value in that. So um, maybe all other attendees, do you see that as a, as a good possibility or may have some practical um, examples where we can adapt agriculture to climate change by digital solutions? Is that a, a big part or is it just a small one? So what do you think? I think uh, it is the main part and uh, we must use the technology in farming, uh, farming practices because uh, uh, it, it is the future that we must use uh, the technology and uh, in cooperation with uh, the scientists and with other uh, farmers or um, um, other scientists, we can do the better uh, we can in order uh, to have uh, good farming practices. I mean, I can I can add here something because I mean, in, in, in Atlas, what what we are doing and and what what you have seen also today in the presentations, a significant part of that is irrigation, uh, water management, and when we talk about uh, adaptation to to climate change, uh, water usage will be a very important topic in my opinion, even in northern European countries or in. in for example, in Germany, if you look at the, the, the last the last three to, to, to five years, if you look at, at the summers, uh, it was hot and we had almost no, no rain decades before. And uh, that's, that's my opinion. But I think irrigation will become a hot topic here in, in, in Europe. And uh, we need sophisticated water management to do that. And uh, all this sophisticated management is uh, related to having data available, having digital technology available, having means available to, to bring data together to make informed decisions. Yes, as uh, Stefan said, and uh, it is, uh, he has a uh, right, we try to uh, reduce, the, uh, to make a good, uh, water management and irrigation management because uh, we maybe we use uh, plenty of water some uh, days and some other days maybe we must uh, irrigate more so with this uh, information of uh, the other project we will have a better uh, water management here in Greece and in our field. Yeah, that's right. So water is, I think, number for it because I see it also that way that water is the, um, becomes maybe also the new oil or even it is already, but we don't have to pay that huge <laughs> amount of money for it. 
hopefully it will stay that way but it's even more important for us it's just not priced that um the big part so that's a, a good part also to protect it i think it's also a very good um, example for um for digitalization in agriculture to have that targeted fertilization and that um and also how to yeah, pollute it or not even um, not pollute it because you have a really targeted fertilization and then you have clean water that you can use for a lot of um yeah things where you need it yeah, for drinking water. And that's also a big point of worldwide agricultural digitization. And that's, I think that's very good examples. So, and um, I also like that um, the comparison with the climate change, because then it comes really also to our starting um, question, the state had a new oil. And when we look to that, we have to say, okay, um, oil is responsible or digging out oil and burning it. Um, that this oil business in the end is responsible for climate change. Yeah. So what we see is digging out oil and burning it is not sustainable. So that's um, that's a very important part. So I won't say that it was a wrong decision or whatever. It's just it's helped us a lot. And also the moment, um, also getting quick to a hospital is not possible without oil, but um, or mostly not. Um, and so you, you need that in, in very good cases. But we see it, it's not the future. And it was just 150 years. That was also why I'm struggling with saying now data is the new oil, because we see for yeah, a good um, timeline that oil was very important for mankind. But we see also that since, let's say, the last 50 years, that digital solutions or electronics and digital solutions becoming more and more important for mankind. But my estimation is in 100 years, it's even more important and people don't say the same like about oil now. Yeah, we have to stop using oil. And I think in 150 years, we say, okay, in the next thousand years, we need digital solutions as well. So that's, I think it's, um, in my opinion, and I'm also interested in yours, um, data is much more valuable than oil. And also digital solutions in the end, like we also hear to, um, to summarize that, um, is, is much more important than than oil business or the data business is much more important when we use it in the right way. We have quite some good examples in the agriculture where we see already a lot of value but um also my feeling out of that discussion is the biggest possibilities out of or the biggest value from data and digitalization is in future not in in the moment yeah we we have just some percentage some small percentage of that and we really start in that business for the next um yeah, let's say at least thousand years honestly i can't imagine what we should use um to, to replace digitalization in future. Yeah. For oil, we have a lot of ideas to replace it, but for digital solutions, I'm not sure. We can just change the hardware underneath to to um, you know, to other technology, but that's already digital as well. So that's um that's uh, so I see a much higher value for data. But also to say in the moment, which farmer is really willing to pay the same amount for digital solutions than to pay for for um, diesel, for example? Yeah? For a normal crop farmer, it's 50 euros per hectare in diesel and here without taxes. Let's say the taxes are but it's, um, 50 euros and you will really invest every year 50 euros per hectare, maybe not in a, in apple farming. That could be because it's more intensive. But for wheat, I have my doubts. That they really invested in the moment but in future i think it will happen because we we will create the value for it to to make it so i agree that yeah, yeah I, I i agree but there are uh, still a lot of challenges uh, for the future so to improve the trust uh, in uh, in data and uh, to improve also the skills inside the the, the companies uh, so that they can approach uh, these uh, uh, important uh, um, shift from uh, current situation to uh, a digitalized uh, new new environment, new new solution. So uh, I agree with you that this is uh, a slow uh, process which has to be faced uh, together with the support of uh, uh, research and innovation on one side, technology providers, uh, absolutely for uh, uh, facing these uh, different challenges uh, which are still there in particular in agri-food uh, sector yeah totally agree with that we have a lot of challenges it's sometimes it feels like driving in the first car ever built yeah 
to produce digital technology and that was a very hard work to come from A to B. But now we talk about self-driving cars and that's, I think also, there's a lot of in, very interesting um, yeah, challenges to, to solve for, for people like us. So that's, um, yeah, I yeah, think I, we, we are running a bit out of time. So front, last comment maybe, Oscar. No, I, I was I was going to reinforce what you said before on uh, how can we try to make the farmers investing some of their money in uh, getting value. So they are making uh, a uh, liter of diesel cost whatever money. Okay, well, uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's more related to the return of the of that investment rather than to the uh, to to how it's really actually costing them. Okay. So obviously uh, a data solution, it's not a cheap one, obviously not, because it's built on top of uh, on top of data, it's built on top of expertise, it's built on top of high skilled uh, people. And, and in any case, uh, that has to be paid, okay? But uh, just imagine that a, a solution may cost, I don't know, 5,000 euros, uh, but that solution is reaching the possibility of getting you less uh, less losses by 3,000 euros. Okay, so at the end of the day, that solution has costed you actually 2,000 euros, basically because you pay five, you got three back, so okay, so that's fine, okay, that's fine, uh, but, but that's maybe only for the first year. So in the second year, you get the same ratio of uh, reducing losses by 3K, uh, you are actually getting 1K profit. And, and at the end of the day, what we need to, to point out is that it's not what the money will cost you any kind of data solution. It's more about how much value and then money and the benefit and profit will you take over the three, four, five years instead of just seeing the, the immediate solution. Because at the end of the day, you, you pay 50 uh, euros for, for diesel and yeah, that diesel will last you, I don't know, for, uh, around, uh, for two arable crops, uh, feed, sorry. But then you need to spend 50, 50 more euros, and then 50 more euros, and then 50 more euros. But in, on the other side, the data solution is applicable to all farm, the entire farm, regardless where it's located here or there, simply because it's being connected to other services, like weather stations, irrigation, management, health of the crops, whatever. Sorry that I have to interrupt you, but I think that was a very good conclusion of our whole discussion in the end. And I have to give up back to our moderators um, now because we're running out of time. And now we can introduce that or in, intensive that in the networking part. But I give back to the, yeah, to the moderators. Great. Thank you, Karsten. Thank you, all the panelists. It was right on time. Uh, and I think we leave the audience with many brainstorming ideas and probably change opinions. Is that a really the new oil? We will let you now discuss this in, as Karsten mentioned, in a networking session that we have organized now. So after when I wrap up this, um, you will see now the link in the chat. It's called wonder.me. And the idea is to split in seven different groups to exchange all the impressions, views, opinions, questions, anything you want to the joint uh, sessions speakers, to our panel discussion um, moderator, um, as well as Stefan Reading, who has introduced to you the Atlas Network, so about the Atlas Network. Um, you will see there the link, so as soon as you go there, we will explain this directly to you on the platform. But before you do so, I would like to thank you all again. A big thank you to our speakers, who did a fantastic, a fantastic job with their presentations of the Euro cases, Karsten and our panelists, uh, for their great contributions to the discussion on the value of data. And of course, my team behind the camera, Tamara and Francie, your prize support has been incredible uh, throughout the event and of course to all of you uh, in the audience for sticking to the event until the very end. Uh, we will follow up with you via email to obtain your feedback on how you perceived the event went via a survey that we have prepared so stay tuned and we will keep in touch. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe to our mailing list. You will also see the link in the chat uh, to keep abreast of all the Atlas latest developments. 
And that's it from my side. We look forward to seeing you all in the Atlas Network very soon. Thank you all again. Have a wonderful rest of the day and see hopefully many of you uh, in our networking session. Thank you. Bye.